seconds to comply. I think you'd better do what he says, Mr. Kenny. You have 60 seconds to comply. This is minute 21. Part man? Part machine. All part. This minute begins with Bodica saying, I'm sure you are, and ends with him pointing a gun at Murph saying, Oh, that... Oh, the taunting is so good. Speaking of taunting, we are getting so agonizingly close to the good stuff, <laughs> and we can't talk about it. We literally have to wait, like, maybe a couple of seconds into the next episode before when we finally get some of the more gruesome gear. Um, That's the thing, when you are doing a Movies by Minute podcast, the pleasurable build-up, <laughs> the suspense becomes agonizing when it's only one week at a time. The movie's edging us. I think I spent most of what I would have said on this episode last week, but at the same time, the acting in this scene is phenomenal between um, Peter Weller and... Um, my brain is just going, Clarence Bodica. No, what's his face? Um, Kurtwood Smith. Yes. Yeah, it's one of those scenes where I kind of just forgot there were actors. Yeah. Because I've been doing movies by minute for so long... I am very analytical when I watch things. You know, it's funny watching movies with normal people where they get swept <laughs> up in the romance of a rom-com or whatever. Whereas meanwhile, I'm mm. in the corner there going, mm, but why did they frame it from a low angle? I just don't really see why this is... You know. <laughs> yeah, so I, I'm always approaching... And I'm very aware that these are actors and what they're bringing to it. So it's nice when I do have a moment where I just go, oh yeah, this is just happening. I'm not thinking of it in terms of being a piece of fiction yeah no it's uh it's it's a weird thing like the first time you start learning the tools of like uh, analyzing media and not necessarily criticism but like definitely just analyzing stuff mm. like it's almost impossible to train your brain to not do it yeah you can't spell analysis without spelling anal pretty much <laughs> and we are anal and why sis why <laughs> oh god that's a bad joke <laughs> What are you doing, stepbrother? I don't even know where that came from. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. No, I remember the first time I started doing media analysis in... anal uh, if you will. I, 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 when I first started being anal, uh, <laughs> which is... Yeah, it was like the first time I watched a movie after starting learning some of these like, uh, analytical tools and media and like, maison scene, cinematography, blah, 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 blah. French words. Yeah, it's just one of those things where your brain just starts going, oh, and at the same time it's like, oh, no, I'm going to be one of those assholes. <laughs> and here I am. And here we are. <laughs> here we are being those assholes. So I thought we would dip into the cinematic chiasmus. I think that's how you sp pronounce it. It's a very obscure word. I no idea. Chiasmus, chiasmus, <laughs> however you want to say that, um, of Robocop, which is basically, it means that the film is perfectly symmetrical. So, uh, mm. where we are now, Alex and, and Lewis are separated to take on uh, Bodica's gang, and that lines up with Robocop and Lewis split up to take on Bodica's gang once again at the exact same uh, factory, I think. It bookends the movie really well that they actually end up at the same location, you know, the birth of Robocop and, well, the downfall of Murphy and... It, I think I'm, I'm not sure if I've made a note in that or made a note for something else, but yeah, it's like the the symmetry is really. really oh yeah, good. because just uh, so because it's a chiasmus, it moves out. I know where I made the comment. It was in the upcoming minute. Uh, well, by the time this is out, it was the last last episode's uh, description. Let me just bring it up. I wrote, Sparks fly when Alex first meets Clarence eye to eye. Neither of them would realize they would each become the most important person for the rest of their lives. And it's kind of true. Yeah, actually. And so, uh, going back to the symmetry there. Oh, yeah, please give me your notes. So the scene before this is a car chase in, in the first act. In the third mm -hmm. act, the scene after Lewis and Robocop splitting up is a car chase with Bodica. And then Bodica is killed. But then if you work in the first act backwards, it's uh, Murphy is killed, car chase with Bodica, um, oh, and then splitting up, sorry, forgot that bit too. But yeah, it just moves outward from the middle so beautifully. Well, here's the uh, interesting thing. I was actually going to bring this up, well, probably about a year from now. Uh, there was actually a scripted car chase that happens before the... Uh, 
the show down at the uh, the factory. In the original script and in the original novelization, it's this thing where this is after the shootout. Murphy gets repaired, and the cops are striking, and it's like this big thing where like Murphy's cleaning up the town, and then it attracts Bodica. There's a chase. Uh, Bodica's gang returns to the factory. Uh, Murphy hunts them down, shoot out of the factory. I prefer this version where it's just that thing of it, it. It's a bit more symmetrical, and like I like the idea that you know he returns to a place like to rebuild himself, to be reborn again as Murphy. I don't know if uh, I got. I can't remember the director's name. Uh, help me out here. Verhoeven? Verhoeven, Verhoeven, yeah. My brother's like Villeneuve because I've been doing Blade Runner 2049. <laughs> it's like, it's definitely Villeneuve. It's not Villeneuve! Verhoeven. I don't know, I could see Villeneuve doing this film. <laughs> oh my, oh my god, Villeneuve doing a Robocop? Yes. Yes, please. <laughs> He's worked with the Robot Mans before. Let's face it, Blade Runner is the Robocop sequel we all needed. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think he's actually spoken about the Chiasmus the symmetry of the film, I wonder if it did just sort of happen accidentally. I don't know. It's, it's too perfect to be a coincidence, right? Yeah, this movie is one of those weird things where, like, some of it feels, like, almost serendipitous, like, listening to, like, some of the background behind the scenes and, like, how nobody saw this as a serious film. Like, even the original writers are kind of like, this is just a, a schlocky action film, and it took someone like Verhoeven to, uh, well, sorry, Verhoeven's wife, in fact, to see that there's something to this. And I think they all brought something into this movie. Like, I'll bring this up in commentary, but like, uh, even like Verhoeven's Christ allegory kind of stuff, bringing that into the film, taking this so seriously, I think the car chase would have ruined it, to be honest. Actually, the idea that Bodica has to hunt down Robocop on orders from Dick Jones. This film is taking the right amount of seriously. It's yes. It's not so serious like the Robocop remake, but yes. it, it knows what it is. And that, yeah. I think, is perhaps one of the most appealing aspects and most enduring aspects of the original Robocop is... It knows exactly what it is, and what it is is like nothing you've seen before. Mm. Yeah, it's it's weird for such a movie to... Hell, it, a movie like this would barely get made nowadays, unless it was in the indie scene, but um, we, we just don't get much things like this anymore, because either it's too camp or it's too serious, or like, the balance is not there. And... Well, especially because of how expensive movies, especially yeah. movies it, it released in cinemas... Ah, you know, something like Wonder Woman 1984 yeah. is just such a freaking mess tonally because it didn't seem to know what it wanted to do, but it could have been another Robocop. Honestly, it had the bones to be that. I don't necessarily agree with that. I'm one of those people that actually thought the tone was actually right, but... Um, oh, yeah, I, I think it's an absolute mess, but we can agree to disagree. We, we can agree. To, like, yeah, with Captain Marvel, we're not, we're I not, <laughs> think we're it's not, still, Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're not discussing that movie. No, we'll be here all day. No, um, no but uh, the the other big problem with uh, the big blockbuster movies like uh, Wonder Woman, and well, this is the problem. It, we're living in the COVID era. Is that throw, they'll happily throw three hundred million dollars at a wall, regardless of what the the project is, because they're expecting to make three times as much. I think the silver lining, COVID. Mm. You know, even though we have lost so many lives we have gone through a lot the silver lining is that the the system is crumbling and we will have to mm. rebuild we will create a new better system hopefully every aspect of culture i feel is, is going to change uh well i don't want to sound pessimistic but i think um there's a few people that need to be to quote hitchhiker's guide to the galaxy the Sirius Cybernetics Corporation will be the first up against the wall once the revolution comes. Hmm. I'm not advocating for violence. I'm advocating for the people... Rome is burning. I'm advocating for the people that are being uh, taking over us to not be put into a position where they can keep control of us. Mm. In Minecraft. Wow, Robocop is so relevant now.
you know <laughs> even more so than ever before amazing good timing on our part we we knew we just we just knew at the point of this recording we've just literally gone through uh, several days of wall street being well not so much wall street but um hedge funding companies on wall street are being absolutely destroyed by uh grassroots uh Redditors who are just sick and tired of these companies short stocking uh, and making billions off of while people are suffering. Good. It's getting to the point where, um, yeah, a failing business in GameStop, which has been going bad for a while now and didn't help with COVID, these companies tried to short stock it. Reddit picked up on this and it went from like four dollars to share to over four hundred odd dollars a share and it's still <laughs> going up because these short stocking uh, hedge fund companies the only way they can they're trying to negate their losses is to try and sell more stock and they're trying to outsell everyone else who hates them from buying but now like billionaires are getting involved as much as i hate elon musk He's actually getting involved, and he's, I'm not sure if he's buying things, but he's at least signal boosting it. Hmm. It's gone crazy, and they're trying to stop the system because the system that they've been playing and tweaking for so long is going against them, and they don't like it, and it hurts their fifis. I love it. And eat the rich. Yes, absolutely. Speaking of eat the rich, OCP. No, I'm kidding. Yeah. <laughs> least... yeah, no, that's, yeah, sadly it's not an OCP minute early, but uh, I, I know. You know, this script, basically you have an iconic line almost every single minute. And this one, yes. it's, buddy, I think you're slime. Slime, yes. Uh, what I love is that that was in the original script, that's in the novelization. That's, this is one of those minutes that's almost purely from page to screen. Lovely. Oh, yeah, it's great that they were able to nail it and it stood it stuck there. Yeah, uh, which doesn't often happen with with movie scripts. But yeah, the way Weller delivers that mm. line, what I find is a lot of actors when they want to seem calm and cool, they just look disinterested. You know, I'm reviewing mm. yeah. Tron Legacy. Oh, Garrett Headland is trying to do this, you know, nonchalant James Dean kind of thing. It just comes mm. off as I'm bored and I'm reading a script. So there is a very fine line. Can I be very controversial and say I've never actually liked James Dean's acting? <laughs> I've uh, not seen apparently his best stuff. Yeah, no, I can't say I'm a huge fan either. He's, he's okay, I guess. Kind of, it's yeah. one of those things, like, they, th these people become icons and then by the time you see it, you kind of go, eh, yeah, I guess so. Because you've seen like everything Brando. that came after. Yeah, we've seen everything mm. that has come after that. And so seeing the, the roots is kind of hard to really... Uh, Neuromancer. I've tried reading Neuromancer, and it's just like the most stock standard cyberpunk story <laughs> ever because it is the first cyberpunk story. Yeah. Or the first Halloween. Halloween is the first slasher movie, and it feels mm. so freaking predictable, bare-bones basic. Hang on, I think uh, Friday the 13th might predate it just slightly, which I was considered more of a slasher film. Well, no, because the first Friday the 13th is just Jason's mother, so... Eh, yeah, but, but it's still know. a slasher film. I think film. that came up... Hang on, now I need to know, because I think... Yeah, to the internet. Um, but I would say, like, Halloween is a lot more of a suspense horror. Halloween's 1978, and... Whereas Friday the 13th was kind of the slasher horror. Yeah. Like, there's, like, Halloween is relatively bloodless, and I, I do genuinely adore that. Uh, Friday the 13th came two years after Halloween. Okay. Well, my point still stands, and I still think of, like, as a template, I think Friday the 13th is, like, the prototypical slasher, but Halloween probably, yeah, probably inspired it then, definitely. Well, just in terms of big dude, jumpsuit, mask, weapon, will yeah. follow you to the oh, ends of the okay. earth. Okay, in that case, yeah, I, I totally grokked that, but like the, the actual template of yeah, isolation, yeah. gore, wide range of interesting kills, that's probably the first thing. I am in such a horror phase right now, and it's, just, it's a shame I'm not <laughs> Well, you're going through the 80s. I am a going through, yeah. time for... Prime, prime time, time yeah. for horror. Uh, welcome to prime time, bitch! <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I forgot to say about uh, Peter Well. Yeah, you can tell, like, behind the eyes, he, he, there is an intensity that he's, he mm. is tense. There is fear and uncertainty there. 
but he's playing it cool. It's just like, how do you do those two things at the same time? There's like almost a thing of like, I'm kind of boned. I know who this guy is, but at the same time, I'm not giving him the pleasure. Yeah. And I think that's ultimately... Well, he's, he's going to die anyway, but I think that's ultimately why I think uh, Clarence maybe wants to play with him a bit more until that point where it's just like, yeah, I'm over it. Hmm. I've had my fun. It's interesting to say, like, Clarence has the first shot and the last shot. All the gore was his gang. Mm. But we'll get into that later. Like, There's only, like, a few variances on the script, and that's a lot of it is Joe, but that actor feels like he was just jiving on on set mm. i don't want to use that word but it just feels like it's just like yeah i'm just adding all the sass i do like that guy mm. i don't know if he's done anything else but i really do like that guy there is a little bit of a difference in the novelization now that i think about it it actually adds more lewis oh yeah because lewis is like oddly absent from most of this and it's mostly like just like a paragraph or two but it's just lewis coming to and trying to okay so in the novelization she gets knocked down an elevator shaft so it's her trying to escape the elevator shaft and i think taking lewis off the board in the movie and leaving her like absent from all this at least this setup i think makes her when she does come back a lot more powerful yeah she witnesses the horrific event and she's powerless to stop it but it's that thing where she knows that if she tried to stop it, there would be two corpses. Mm. And she did her best to save Murphy and... But we can talk about that later. Yeah. We're not quite there yet. Uh, it's so frustrating. No, but... God damn it! You got me into this stuff. <laughs> Welcome to my world. I do love how the shot is set up. Like, you know, Murphy gets knocked to the ground and there's like this almost diagonal line between the two of them where... Murphy's on the ground. Michelangelo-esque. Yeah, and... Tableau, there's a word, tableau. Yeah, I, I never noticed that, you know. He feels now set up when you're looking in hindsight and when you're literally scaring over this minute, like, several times, just looking at detail and stuff like that. Screaming at the, the screen, Give me something! <laughs> Anything! Well, how when he gets knocked down and um, Clarence puts his foot on... Murphy's arm, and it actually preempts the later shot. Because, but part of me is there going, "Oh, maybe this is Clarence knows what he's going to do, but he's toying with Murphy by like you know, you know, putting doing the na 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 yeah. But we'll talk about that next week. Even though <laughs> he is brought back, it is still shocking when your main character dies early on. Yes, yes. It creates a real sense of stakes. Yeah, there's not many movies, when you think about it, that has... Well, like, the, the major character dying and being reborn, like, in this kind of way. At least, especially in this very violent kind of way. Mm. Even a superhero movie where, like, a character dies, it's, like, never as gruesome or it's, like... Honestly, I think what Robocop has most resemblance to in this respect is the rape-revenge fantasy movies yes. of the 60s, 70s, that sort of exploitation movies. Yeah. Very much so. Yeah, it definitely has that vibe to it, which is... Kill Bill, which is based on those. Yeah, I was going to say the most probably infamous one of the genre is I Spit on Your Grave, mm. uh, as like probably the um, the one that's probably most well associated, at least. The thing with Rape Revenge, it's never usually a male orientated uh, no. story. It's often female. But then there is also the trans allegory that you could read into Robocop, so that kind of all ties together. Yeah, I was thinking about that as I said it, but yeah, it's the uh, it's a great subversion, and it does also, you know, play into male power fantasy as well, a little bit. Mm. I get the big strong body, blah 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 blah. Okay. Yeah. You don't have a dick, but, you know. This film has a history of shooting dicks off. You could kind of see it as as a kind of violation or a rape, because, yeah, he is mm. technically castrated. He is violated. He he goes mm. through all of that. Yeah, I never really thought of it in the, in the context of the rape-revenge movie genre, but, yeah. my God, it does work so well. Yeah. I, 
I think that's one cool thing about this movie is you can pin it down to a genre because yeah, it's an action flick. But it's got so many good elements for God, because yeah, it has horror elements, it has comedy, it's multifaceted, and I think that's why it's also preserved. It was a popular film to begin with, but it's a movie people can keep coming back to. Yeah, it, it's just, it's got so much to give. That's why, I mean, that's why we're doing the movies by minute, that yeah, it astounds me that for a film that I've seen so many times... Only now, when I look at it real, real up close, do I notice certain <laughs> things and just go, "Oh my God, this is the multi-level genius." So, as someone who's more of an aficionado of the uh, minute by minute genre than I am, mm-hmm. I, I have to wonder, like, because I've had a look at the lists and stuff like that of the movie by minute. So, to moviebyminute.com, mm-hmm. we are listed on there. We are indeed. I don't think I've actually can never think of a movie I've seen on that list when, like, not necessarily, oh, why did someone pick that? But, like, you know, why is that relevant? Except maybe Kung Pao into the minute. Yes. Who the shit decided to do Kung Pao by a minute? <laughs> what an absolute lunatic. I know, what a moron. But, um, uh, I would uh, consider that to be a cult classic. Ha 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 ha. No, but it's one of those things like, even like a movie like, say, The Room, I can see has enough cultural appreciation or interest to get a Movies by Minute podcast. But there's like a lot of ton of schlocky action films from that, especially of that era, would probably be good for like a series, like of like Best of the Worst in Red Letter Media. Yeah, but yeah. I, I can't see anyone uh, taking like a movie like, what's it called? Actor the. The Eagle Hawk or whatever it is, it's one of those really classically bad films. It's just boring more than anything else. Mm. Or you or you know, like one of the many hundreds of movies that Mystery Science Theatre and Rift Tracks have done. I I just can't see someone going into a minute by minute analysis and that. But something like Robocop, which has I think it's stunned us both. We've said this a few times. Nobody's done this before. Yeah. And it feels like it should have been done. The other one, so I'm, I'm going through my horror phase right now. So Christine <laughs> and Reanimator. Those two are freaking I need to watch brilliant. Reanimator. You have never seen Reanimator? No, no. I keep thinking of Reanimator as a different film, but I realize, no, I've not seen Reanimator. That's Holy the Jeffrey... shit. Jeffrey Combs. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. yeah. Both. Well, okay. So Reanimator especially is is one of those magical movies that satirizes the genre that it still manages to fulfill. Mm. So it is both yeah. schlocky horror and satirizing schlocky horror. It's wonderful. And Christine is just, yeah, a really great classic horror movie, but it is also aware of the ridiculousness of its premise. I think I have a greater appreciation of movies that are aware of themselves, even if they're schlocky. Mm. There's a fine line because there are, there was well, actually yeah. probably from the mid 2000s onwards, there was this sudden trend of deliberately making bad movies because bad movies yes. became popular at all these movie nights. And so you had all these university college kids going out there making their own bad movies. And it's just like, yeah, but you're doing it badly on purpose. So where's the humor? Yeah, I have a copy of The Lost Skeleton of Kadabra. Hmm. which is essentially a someone trying to make an Ed Wood film. And I thought, oh, wow, this is going to be interesting, you know, watching people like hate making their own kind of bad films. But it felt lifeless. Like, hmm. it was genre-savvy enough to go, ha-ha, we're lampooning the bad, but it wasn't introspective enough to be interesting. Yeah, like Sharknado and stuff like that have never appealed to me because I know... Hmm. It's coming from an insincere place. Why the room is so legendary is it's because it's so sincere. All the Neil Brain movies, they <laughs> do believe, need to watch Neil Brain. Oh, they one hundred percent believe in the movies they are making. They think yeah. they are amazing. Yeah, I, I think that's why Tommy Wiseau is such an interesting character. Is because he is a living cartoon. Who? Why? How? Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to jump over to Gaslighting Robocop? I do have commentary. Uh, I love this. Um, Paul describes the this scene as the ultimate nightmare. And if you bring that into the rape-revenge analogy, yes, mm. this is like the worst thing to possibly happen to a person without sexual assault. Yeah. Yeah, the complete dehumanization of a person and the savagery upon it. Why do we so 
rarely see rape with male characters. I think Lawrence of the Arabia is the only one I can think of, and it's kind of just hinted at. You don't actually yeah. see anything. Well, you could look at it as from, like, say, a feminist theory point of view and, like, the old idea of, like, male gays being a thing, movies are being made predominantly for male audiences, especially around about this time, so guys don't want to see that. There has been male rape depicted in films, but that's not necessarily a mainstream thing. Mm -hmm. Or if it is, it's kind of comedic. Like, let's face it, the the prison rape trope is played for laughs in a lot of mainstream media. Or, uh, what was it, This Is The End? The James Franco movie? Yeah, I was going to say, it's not that I get confused by that and The World's End. It's one of those things that, did I watch This Is The End? I realized, oh no, it's a Seth Rogen film. No, I didn't. I love it. It it just, (laughs) it ends on a dance sequence to Backstreet's Back, and it's just like, yes, yes, this is everything I want. I'm making a joke at Seth Rogen. He's just one of those guys I'm not particularly, I'm not, I don't hate the guy, but it's just that thing I'm like, yeah, um, whatever. (laughs) I can take it or leave it with this stuff. Yeah. Going back, just quickly diverging back into the whole prison rape as a gag thing, they even did that in Toy Story 3. The, what's the word? The allegorical raping of Buzz Lightyear. I don't remember that. Again, uh, Shawshank Redemption. It's even shot like the, the, the implied rape scenes in Shawshank Redemption. Oh my god. Yeah. Wow. Um, Twenty Was that 2010? Yeah, 2010 was a different time. Yeah. That that's a that's a subject in its own self uh, regarding male rape depiction in movies and how it's sometimes used comedically and it's always used to empower the male to a certain degree. Like it's a victimization, whereas like female victimization is also used to empower men, which is the women in fridges trope in comics. Mm-hmm. And this is a rabbit hole that I'm going to try and... We would never get out. Yeah, we, we wouldn't get out. <laughs> because I do have this quote from uh, John Davison, the producer. With Paul, lots of things become Christ metaphors. So they always go to the studio to defend how violent the scene was by saying you have to have the crucifixion so we can have the resurrection of Peter as Robocop. Hmm. To which Ed Newmeyer also adds, we have a little bit of stigmata coming up. You know, just just a little. <laughs> Yeah, I didn't think of that. He does shoot him in both hands, I think. Brodica shoots Murphy in his right hand, and I believe his left arm gets shot completely off in the um, barrage, and which, of course, leads to the gag, we, we, we managed to save the arm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Why would you do that? I think they talk about this in the commentary, but uh, it's a little bit uh, obscure. The, mic- the How they're talking, it's a bit mixed message, because it sounds like... Um, a lot of this was cut for the R rating in America. and But it also sounds like maybe some of this wasn't cut as well. It's weird, because there is a director's cut out there, which apparently is a bit more gruesome. Hmm. But I don't think this is the, the cut we've got, as is the standard cut. And there are probably TV edits of this out there as well, so that's a, its own thing. Yeah. A lot of this stuff just would not make it to air, you know, especially back then. You know, it reminds me of when like we used to get uh, M-rated cuts of things like Total Recall in the cinemas, and then we'd get an R-rated cut on VHS, and it was the same cut, but then they'd have an M-rated cut, which was just slightly less gory. Mm. But you'd never rent it because the R-1's out there. I think our rating system in Australia makes way more sense. It's G, PG, yep. M, MA, and then R. Whereas in America, it's like there's PG-13, and then there's no M, I think. It, it, or there's no MA, it just goes straight to R. Yeah, the um, the PG-13 is essentially our M mm. in, in many aspects. Oh, uh, I know. But why not just... The stepping it? is weird. Yeah. Like, why would you use the same letter twice? It could get confusing. If I remember correctly, it was... Um, I think it might have been the first Keaton Batman movie was actually... Or one of movies around about that era was actually what led to the creation of the PG mm. rating in America because it was just like G, M, R, X kind of thing, whatever. Hmm. They needed a, essentially an older kid-friendly rating because younger kids were just probably a little bit too, you know, disturbed. Yeah. So, should we move on to the uh, Robocop remake? Alex, how do you feel? I feel fine, Dr. Norton. Gaslighting, brother, if you will. Uh, yeah, I guess so. 
So an article came out uh, this week or last week. I think. Let's see. It was five days ago. So this week, as of recording it. Uh, mm-hmm. And Joel Kinnaman talks about why he doesn't think the reboot didn't work. Oh yeah, I vaguely uh, recall reading this. <laughs> what I feel like uh, this is a quote I should say. What I feel like the whole movie didn't take into account is what the fans loved about the original, and you have to pay homage to that. And I think the producers and filmmakers and me included didn't really understand how to do that in the right way. Hmm. I think it's a really solid movie. It just didn't fit the RoboCop concept. Oh, sorry. That was the first big movie I did. I had to quell all my instincts for everything over the course of that film. I'm like, why am I wearing a black suit? That doesn't make any sense at all. <laughs> the first interview I did for Robocop, and it was right after I was cast, I got the first question for Robocop, and the question was, so is it going to be R-rated? And I'm like, of course it's going to be R-rated. Only an idiot would make Robocop a PG-13 movie. <laughs> Cue to the next morning, 47 missed calls I woke up to. <laughs> Yeah, I, I would dispute him on it still being a solid film, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, that was quite interesting, though. Yeah. Because you, you often don't get that inside. People don't tend to talk about their films after the fact. And when they're promoting the film at the time, you're not allowed to be honest. I wish they were allowed to be honest. Oh, wouldn't that be wonderful? No, it's actually really funny sometimes when you do get an actor or a creative on a movie that's just lambasting their own project it (laughs) happens very rarely though yeah you have to be pretty ballsy almost never happens in the in the big hollywood machine i feel like you'd have to be on like a tom hanks level of untouchableness to be able (laughs) to do that like i think tom hanks could be like frankly this is not my best work and i'm sorry but i had fun doing it or something like that yeah i think if tom hanks was ever mean and nasty that would be the only sign you knew he was being taken over by aliens. Mm. It does not seem to that the guy has a nasty bone in his body. No, I can't imagine. Even it. when he was a comedian, he was kind of wholesome. Yeah. I, I, what I would really love is Patrick Stewart saying, you know what, I have made a turd of, of a TV show here with uh, Picard. Well, shit. That's exactly what I was hoping to spare you from. <laughs> <laughs> But you know what? I wanted to put on an outrageous French accent and uh, wear oh, eye patch, so. Yeah, Jean-Luc Picard, that famous French person known for his famous French accent. Hmm. Um, so, yeah, nothing happens in this friggin' minute of gaslighting. <laughs> but uh, we basically, we have sellers being shown a bunch of... Uh, war veterans, injured war veterans to be considered for the Robocop project and all I get out of this because I don't really know what the criteria is that he's going for here but I'm assuming it's no fatties and no blacks (laughs) (laughs) well my comments was um, I actually had two lines here I I feel a bit mean for the next one but here we go go. Rick Flagg mumbles his way through his scene Mm -hmm. that's pretty accurate No, the thing where it comes to the um the cop selection was, did Rich Evans do a cameo? <laughs> I'm uh, sorry. That's mean. I'm sorry, Rich, I love you, but it was just worth it. <laughs> <sighs> it's clearly a prosthetic gut and beard and all that on the guy, because he was obviously just a regular looking dude in his cop shot, and they had to... Just patted him up. But as soon as I saw him, I'm like, oh god, he looks like Rich. <laughs> I, I didn't think so. It's just you're saying it's just he's ginger and yeah. It's just the beard and all that. It's just like, mm. oh god. <laughs> I'm, I'm, just, I'm hearing Rich's laugh. He's so great. But he's my favorite guy in the Red Letter Media bunch. Yeah. He at least looks like he's just just having fun. <laughs> um. Yeah. So I don't really know why. What? What? Why is he making these selections? Because you don't know anything about these people and their bodies don't really matter you know why does so all i assume is i know i don't want the fat one i don't want the black one that's all that that's all i can get from this if we're gonna give the movie the benefit of the doubt in this we are because we are analyzing this minute by minute and his selection process might become more apparent later on but um i don't recall i honestly just do not recall and i'll I'll, okay yeah i don't think there was i've not bothered re-watching this film (laughs) Yeah, I've, I've watched it a few times at Bad Movie Nights and stuff, and uh, yeah, so I don't think it's ever revealed, but then I don't pay that I much attention. Recall. It doesn't matter. Who cares? This is... I, oh, God. The, I've forgotten this movie. This scene. Oh, this minute. 
the bad guy puts the bomb on Murphy's car at the oh, yeah, hospital yeah. where there's fucking security everywhere. He could have done it at his house because who would have paid dead of night? No. No. Oh, yeah, so... <laughs> this is uh, stupid. Murphy visits Lewis in the hospital and he mumbles about some shit <laughs> about the gangsters or whatever. And then he's like, oh, you're not really sleep, are you? And then Lewis is like, I oh, gotcha, gotcha, bitch. Hey, bro. Yeah, that's about it. Mm. So, yeah, I think that covers these minutes. Uh, yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> I wish there was something more to say about the, the 2014 minute. But... I think we talked enough. I think we talked more than yeah. I thought we were going to. Yeah, I, God, it's just dumb. And I think that's the thing that's kind of a bit bugging me with the the remake is that all the minutes we get with the Murphy plot are just fucking stupid. Yep. And again, all the interesting stuff was with Sellers. Although, like, yeah, we're not really getting that much in here. We barely see him. But like, well, all of this minute, I would say the Seller stuff was all I could talk about. Uh, as <laughs> it was the most I could goof on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm going. I, 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 I was a bit mean on my goof, but at the same time, that's just what I thought when I saw it. <laughs> Which is... And the thing is, they have done an episode on Robocop and the Robocop remake in Half on the Bag, so I think that's kind of what my brain was just... Yeah, felt felt the uh, the connective tissue there. Hmm. <laughs> I wonder, with this, this COVID world or the post-COVID world... It, how these sort of reboot make walls are going to be. Are we going to get them the same way as ever? Is something going to change? I don't know. What is nostalgia going to be in the near future? Well, think about it. We've talked about how uh, cyclic um, nostalgia is. You know, this thing of like, we're seeing these movies from the 90s, the movies from mm. the 80s, even some of the movies from the 70s. The 20, 30 year rule, yeah. Yeah, and are being remade and re reimagined. And like, there's always a new Star Wars, there's always a new Star Trek, there's always a new this, there's always a new that. I can't wait to the point where all of a sudden, like, oh, We've just been remaking everything for 30 years. We have no new ideas, and all these remakers are just being... not doing any business. We need to invest in new, new ideas. I know. We'll make, remake the Robocop remake. Ay. Oh my god, just re- reboots all the way down. Yeah, it's reboots forever. We're stuck in an infinite cycle of suck. Mmm. <sighs> But hopefully that means that we will finally get a Knight Rider movie that isn't terrible. You look like crap. Fuck you, kid! Hasselhoff still talks about it. Well, we what, uh, just over ten years since the last, uh, attempt at a Knight Rider, so it's about due. Hmm. Yeah, let's, uh, wrap it up. So you can find me at travingdesigns.com, T-R-A-V-A-N. That's where you'll find Prometheus by Minute, Covenant Minute, that's just uh, started. Uh, head on over to patreon.com slash Designs. you can get advanced episodes of that. Legacy Minute, and I've just recorded Minute 2049, Blade Runner 2049, today. Ooh. As for me, uh, check me out at Fandom Crossing and... The ever popular Kung Pao into the mid. <laughs> and you can definitely check us out and more on Simplecast, Apple, Google, Spotify, and the U of Tubes. Click like, share, subscribe, all that funky stuff. Feed the algorithm. Feed the algorithm. <laughs> that was actually pretty good. Put Frank Wilk at a shame. Yeah, I just first decided to go a bit Dr. Claw there. Yeah. <laughs> but more importantly, until next time. Robocock. <laughs> That's a hell of a gap. <laughs> I was building up. I was building up tension. Robocock.